the title of this morning's message, this morning's sermon from Hebrews 6, 13 through 20 is titled, Be Assured, Be Assured, A Promise and an Oath from the God Who Never Lies. Be Assured, A Promise and an Oath from the God Who Never Lies. So a few weeks ago, I preached on the warning, the warning passage in Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 8. The command from God to all of his people to do what? To go on to maturity. To go on to maturity. To not stay as infants in faith and knowledge, but to go on to maturity. In our doctrine. In our knowledge. That we would be growing in our love for God. That we would be increasing in our knowledge of the word of God and his truth. So we were given this command followed by a chilling warning, a chilling warning, a grave warning that that those who stay immature by staying on the milk of the word, by blowing off or downplaying the meat, the deep truths of the word of God, that that is also to be not growing as a Christian. And more, the warning was that anyone doing that, anyone in that place is at great risk potentially risk of proving that not only are they not a Christian, they never really were one. And moreover, that anyone who continually stays in this position, even experiencing things while they're there, here for the experiences, but not truly born again, being sanctified, growing and maturing in faith and knowledge, to be in that position, stuck in that position, is to be at risk of permanently falling away. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, for it is impossible. In the case of those who have once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of age to come, the book of Hebrews says, for it is impossible to restore them again. If they've fallen away, to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him in contempt. This is a grave warning. But I will remind us, it's a loving warning for at least two important reasons. First, because to leave someone in a place of great danger and not tell them that they are in great danger is very hateful. Second reason, to desire for someone to truly know and love God, to be born again into salvation, true faith in Christ, to desire that for someone, that they would be growing and maturing in faith and not in a place of great danger, to desire for someone to have that kind of faith, true faith, saving faith in God, is to desire something for them that is very good, that is very loving. Life save, saving faith, saving faith is life-changing faith. Saving faith is life-changing faith, and eternity is on the line. So to want that for someone, to lovingly want that for someone, to motivate them, and in Hebrews we even see we're called to warn them if they're in that place. That is the greatest kind of love. Great love wants the greatest possible good for the one being loved. Great love wants the greatest possible good for the one being loved. And there is no greater good than true salvation. Which means there may be no worse thing than to think one has salvation when they do not. And so we got this warning in Hebrews 5.11 through six, chapter 6, verse 8. Then last week, Brian showed us that the writer of Hebrews had even more in mind with that warning. Not only to warn those who think they are saved and yet are in great danger, but to encourage those who are unsure of their faith and yet need to be encouraged. So he goes from warning those with false assurance, he warns those with false assurance who think they are saved and and may not be, may never have been, to encouraging those with true faith who need true assurance, who need assurance of their faith. So last week's text ended like this. He 
Hebrews 6, 11 through 12, and we desire, so after the warning, he says, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have full assurance of hope until the end. Why? So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This is why the warning is there. This is why God does not want us to base our faith only on experiences or decisions or anything in ourselves. Or to think just because we're here or call ourselves a Christian or are around Christians and sometimes even see God moving around us that we would think, oh, that's enough. No. God wants so much more for us. That's way too superficial and possibly fake. God wants his people to be absolutely certain. To have full assurance of faith. We live in a world where doubt is almost encouraged, even applauded. And here we get the writer of Hebrews saying, I love you. Beloved, I love you. And I want you to be sure of your salvation. Do you remember at the beginning of this section in Hebrews 5, verse 11, we're told there are many who have become dull of hearing the word of God, cannot rightly hear the word of God or understand biblical truth or doctrinal teaching because of their dull ears. We also saw that those dull ears were actually a sign of something much deeper, ultimately a heart that did not fully and radically desire by faith, to know and obey God and all he would have for us. And now we will today, today we will see what God really desires for us. What does God really desire for us then? And it's the exact opposite of that. God desires for us not to have dull faith or hearts set on not fully radically obeying him, God desires for us radically eager faith. Boldly, joyfully, earnestly obedient faith. Faith that eagerly digs in. That desires to devour the word of God. All of it. All the truth and doctrine of God. To live zealously for the Lord. Why? Because of the certainty. The certainty we have. The assurance we have in our faith. So last week we saw from Brian that after the warning to those who are in danger, the dull of hearing, those not fully committed, those not moving on to maturity, the writer goes, gives those a warning, and then he turns to true believers, to the church, and he says, I know you. I know the rest of you. I want the rest of you to be sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. And one of the things he points out, he says, and Brian showed us, he says, I see in you your love for one another and the way you serve one another. That's a good thing. If you love the church and give yourself to serve the church, God will not overlook that. Be encouraged. Be sure, be certain, be bold. Do you see in this text what full assurance leads to? What does full assurance lead to? What is the fruit of full assurance? Earnestness. Diligence, eagerness, boldness, zealousness. Zealous, bold, eager, diligent, radical faith. The fruit of full assurance. On the flip side, what do we see is the fruit of uncertainty? Sluggishness. Laziness. Weak faith. This text calls all true believers to a certain and eager faith. And to any who are not in that place, any who do not have full assurance, and are therefore not zealous, eager, earnest in their faith, he says, come on, this is what we desire for you. So what's the diagnosis then of, what is the diagnosis if the symptom is lazy faith, 
sluggish faith. What's the problem? A lack of assurance. In church, just as there are many who think they are Christian and are not, those who were already warned, there are also some, if not many, who lack assurance, who should have assurance. And that is a scheme of the devil to keep some of us sluggish, weak, lazy, stuck in the faith, sometimes in, sometimes in doubt, not eager and bold, but sluggish and lazy. So then what's the answer? What's the prescription? What's the solution that leads to true, zealous, eager, earnest, boldly radical faith? Assurance. Assurance of salvation. So here again, the writer of Hebrews says, as he's transitioning here, he says, and we desire, looking out at the church, to those who he has not included in the warning, he says, and we desire each of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So where does this full assurance come from? What is this full assurance of hope that will last to the end? What is full assurance grounded in? Or, who is it grounded in? What do you need to know and trust to have full assurance of your faith? Leading to zealous, bold, radical, eager, earnest faith. Our text for today. Hebrews 6, 13 through 20. For, remember coming off that last uh, text, for, when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no, great, no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters to the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The wonderfully powerful word of God to us this morning. I hope you see each of you, as the writer of Hebrews hopes, I hope each of you, if you are not under that warning, I hope each of you see that if you've repented of your sin, put your faith in Jesus to save you. If you desire to live your life by faith in Jesus, God wants you, God desires for you to have full assurance of your salvation. Again, this awesome truth we see in our text is not for those who are under the warning the writer gave to those who are dull of hearing or those who do not desire radical obedience, those who are not moving on to maturity. But this text is for those who are truly saved and need a rock-solid assurance of their salvation. We'll actually see in the months ahead, ahead as we move on that the writer, the author of Hebrews, thinks assurance is such a big deal, such a big deal, that he defines faith in this way. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is not wishy-washy. 
Faith is certain. Faith is convinced. Faith is assurance. Assurance of what? As we'll see, assurance that all of God's promises are true for us and all of God's purposes will stand toward us. God wants his people to have a firm and certain hope. Our Heavenly Father wants us, his children, to know for sure that he loves us. That he will never, ever let us go. If you fathers want that for your children, how much more our Heavenly Father? Assurance of salvation is based on our hope in God's promises and our conviction that God will do all of his purposes. To know for sure, to be completely certain, to know in your heart and your mind and your soul that you are a born-again child of God, no doubt. To know you are saved, to be certain that you are a saved saint to know for sure that you will be with God forever. To be convinced that Jesus has saved you and Jesus is coming back for you. Because you know God fulfills all of his promises and completes all of his purposes. What I want you to see, and even tuck in your mind somewhere, for yourself or for someone else, is that when you see someone has this problem where their faith seems sluggish or lacking or lazy or they're drifting away, you should wonder, are they lacking assurance? Are they constantly wavering or doubting? Are they saved or are they, are they not? It's often, hear me say this, it's often because their salvation is not 100% fully grounded in God and His grace. That's often the problem. When people lack assurance, it's often because their salvation is not fully, 100% grounded in God and His grace. But instead, often those who lack assurance, often unknowingly even, it's due to a gap in their gospel. Instead of their salvation being fully grounded on the past, present, and future work of Christ in his life, death, resurrection, and return, instead of giving all the glory to God who saves all of his elect, the God who sent his Son to die for the sins of all of his people, often those who lack assurance have put at least some of their faith in their salvation in themselves. That somehow, even if just a little bit, in the past they did something, or in the present they're doing something, or something happened, or they saved themselves, contributed to their justification in some way, even though they likely wouldn't say it that way. And if that's true in someone's heart and mind, guess what? They better keep that up. They better keep up that contribution. They better make sure it was real to keep themselves saved or they may lose their salvation or doubt some past event. And that's just not truth. That's just not gospel. That is a powerful lie the devil tells to true believers to strip us of full assurance. It's a crack in the armor of God. In the armor of God, do you remember what the helmet is? What is it that protects your mind, your brain? Well, Paul calls it the helmet of salvation. To be assured of your salvation is to have a helmet on that protects your mind from doubting your salvation. So I ask, do you have an awesome helmet of salvation? Do you have full assurance that will protect you when doubt comes? When things happen? Are you fully sure? I believe that if you would have asked the Apostle Paul, what led him to be so bold? His answer would have been centered on his deep, profound knowledge 
of his salvation and his assurance in his salvation. That Jesus had called him while he was yet a sinner. That Christ had saved him. That Jesus had opened his eyes. That had given him a heart of faith. That Jesus had justified him by his death on the cross. And Jesus crushed his sin and crushed death through, through his resurrection and ascension. That through Jesus, the Spirit of God was sanctifying him. So no matter what happened, he knew it was for his good. His hope was that his future was certain. That he would be with Jesus forever, no matter what happened. He would have said it's because the Father had chosen him. That God the Son had died for him and been raised for him. That God the Spirit was in him and sealed him for salvation. You can hear Paul speak these truths over and over and over again. It's no wonder Paul was so bold and eager in his faith. I'm not going to go into it too deeply this morning, but I do want to add a little challenging meat for you to chew on in the week of hand ahead as you ponder these truths. Since faith is the assurance of things hoped for, therefore, a lack of assurance is one of the greatest attacks of the devil upon the true ter- church. And that attack is deeply ingrained in the theological position called Arminianism. The overly self-focused free will of view of salvation. Self-focused. It's my choice, my decision, my free will, and that chips away at assurance. The doctrines of grace, sometimes called Calvinism, are so clearly biblical and good and glorious, so deeply rooted in God and His power and His glory, the very truth that justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone. If it's God who chose me before the foundation of the world and then called me while I was a totally depraved sinner and then took my heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh, if it is Christ who died for my sin and then rose again and ascended into heaven, that I might be raised from spiritual death to everlasting life, if it is His Spirit in me that is my power to live and breathe and do everything for His glory, what is left for me to take credit for? What is left for me to do? What is left, importantly, for me to base my assurance on? Nothing in me. It is all God. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And what will those do who God saves? Respond to this miracle by repenting of your sin and putting all your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. To get saved? No. Because God saved a sinner like me. So then where do I put all of my hope and assurance in that scenario? In a decision I made? In a prayer I prayed? In my baptism? Or in anything I did? No. My hope, my boast, and my assurance are in God and God alone. And interestingly, one of the more common questions people ask about Calvinism or Reformed theology is this. Won't that make you lazy if you know God does everything? And here in Hebrews 6, we see the exact opposite. The deeper and greater your assurance in God's saving grace, the more zealous your faith and a lack of assurance. Any drop of an idea that you saved yourself, contributed to your salvation in any way, or are keeping yourself saved, any hint of that will lead to sluggish, lazy faith. Let me quote Spurgeon here as Spurgeon quotes Luther. He said this, Spurgeon said this, I will go as far as Martin Luther in the strong assertion of his where he says, if any man ascribes anything of salvation, even the very least thing to the free will of man, he knows nothing of grace and has not learned Jesus Christ rightly. It may seem a harsh sentiment, but he who in his soul believes that man does of his own free will turn to Christ cannot have been taught of God. 
For that is one of the first principles God taught us when he begins with us, that we have neither will nor power, but that he gives both. That he is Alpha and Omega in the salvation of men. Church, since he's the Alpha, the beginning, and the Omega, the end, he's where all of our assurance must be rooted. Not us, but him. So much so that here in our verses, we see God swear upon a promise and make an oath to give us assurance of salvation. Truth number one. Here's where you're going to wish we had a hand up. Truth number one. If God has saved you, be certain of your salvation because God swore an oath upon himself in the promise to Abraham. If God has saved you, be certain of your salvation because God swore an oath upon himself in the promise to Abraham. So we're starting with a promise. Hebrews 6, 13 through 14. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. Again, our text starts with the word for. So what do we do? We're going to look back. We're going to see what comes before. And we see the author had just said, we desire for each of you to have full assurance of your salvation. And to the end, so you won't be lazy, but you would imitate those who inherit what? Promises. So he says, we desire each of you to have full assurance So you can imitate those who inherit the promises. Why, you might ask? Because for when God made a promise to Abraham. What's that? Where do we get assurance there? For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. So the author of Hebrews, in order to give us, the church, deep and strong full assurance of our faith, he goes back to Genesis, where God calls Abraham and then makes this promise to him. Genesis 15, God covenants with Abraham. In Genesis 17, God gives circumcision as a sign of that covenant, but it gets super real when we get to Genesis 22. God calls Abraham to take Isaac, his only son, his beloved son, his long-awaited son. Take him to Mount Moriah to offer him as a sacrifice, to sacrifice his son. And this verse in Hebrews is a quote from Genesis 22. Why? Remember, this is meant to give us assurance, and he's reminding us of the way God gave assurance To Abraham, the man of faith. How did he do that? Through a promise. So Abraham and Sarah were old. They were waiting for a son, the one God had promised them. And that son is miraculously given to them by God. When they're very old, Isaac is born. So Abraham and Sarah finally have a son together, and God says... Abraham, I want you to take your long-awaited son, I want you to take him on this mountain and offer him up as a sacrifice to me. What does Abraham do? He obeys. And just before Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, the messenger of the Lord stops Abraham, Isaac is saved, and God provides the sacrifice himself in the form of a ram. So God provides the way. He makes that very clear. But then he gives a promise. And in that promise of salvation for Abraham, from Abraham and his offspring, God swears an oath upon himself. Listen to the promise of God from Genesis 22. And he, God, said, by myself I have sworn 
declares the Lord. Because you, Abraham, have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And your offspring shall, in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. You see how God began that promise? By myself I have sworn. And then he says, surely I will bless you. Surely I will multiply you. So God makes a promise and puts an oath upon the promise. What is an oath? By myself I have sworn. Why would God do that? Or why do we swear an oath? Why do sometimes we hear people say, I swear I will do this, and if I don't, or I swear on my mother's life, whatever that's about. Well, we do that. People do that because we're untrustworthy. But why would God do that? Because God is weak or untrustworthy? Well, no. Because our faith is weak. Because we'll take our eyes off of God and, and put our eyes upon ourselves. Because we'll say, God took me this far, now I'm going to do the rest. And if any of our faith is in ourselves, God will make it clear that it is He who multiplies, it is He who blesses. And so to make clear that this promise he's about to give to Abraham will happen, that Abraham can be certain, assured, count on it. That God will do it. If Abraham ever doubts or starts to try to do it himself, he can return to this promise of full assurance. God had called Abraham. God had declared him righteous. God had given him the covenant. God had promised him his son. God had delivered him and, and given him the ram as, a, as the alternative. Sacrifice. And now, God was making for sure Abraham knew in all certainty that it is God who would fulfill the rest of the promise. God had accomplished his past purpose, his present purpose in the life of Abraham. So now, he wanted Abraham to know for sure it was not on Abraham to make the rest happen. The future promises of God are all in God's hands as well. God was showing Abraham that just because he provided the son and that part was accomplished, he's saying, don't stop putting your faith in me now. God is saying, I put my everything, my name, my reputation, everything on this promise. I will do it. It is finished. And the oath is for confirmation. Verse 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So God swears upon himself in this promise to Abraham. So Abraham will have full assurance that God will fulfill his promise. What does that have to do with us and our assurance? Why does the author of Hebrews think that this is now how he's going to convince us that we should have full assurance of faith? Why does the writer of Hebrews think this is what we should ground our assurance on instead of ourselves? Well, if you are a child of God, if you, by faith, are truly following Jesus, this promise of God, this sworn oath by God, is to you. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are an heir to, of God's promise to Abraham. The sworn pledge by God to Abraham, guess what? He swore it to you. I want you to see this. We can be fully assured in our faith fully assured in our faith because God made this promise and oath to Abraham. But only if this promise is also for us. 
Verse 17. It says, God desired to show more convincingly to who? Not to Abraham. To the heirs of the promise. So God did that not only for Abraham, but to all who are heirs of this promise. Who are these people? How do you become an heir of this promise? Galatians 3.16, we read, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Most of us, are not physical descendants of Abraham. But there's much more to see in the promise to Abraham. The rest of the verse. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. You see what Paul's saying in the second half of that verse. He's saying... We can look at this promise and have full assurance. He's starting to build us there. Why? Because the promise to Abraham way back in Genesis 22 was a promise to bring from Abraham the ultimate heir of all of the promises of God. The promise is about, the promise is to Jesus. The promise to Abraham. Okay. But why then is this promise supposed to be assurance to me, to us, to those who have faith in Jesus? Well, Paul tells us that too. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. And if you are Christ's, then watch then you are Abraham's offspring, according, heirs according to the promise. As an aside, this is not saying what current liberal theologians will say falsely, that there's no difference between a man and a woman. That's not what it's saying. However, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to being an heir of the promise, this promise that we see to Abraham that God confirms with an oath was not to the physical descendants of Abraham. The promise was to and about Jesus and everyone who is in Christ by faith is therefore an heir to this promise. The promise of God sworn with an oath is to us. So when the author of Hebrews refers to Heirs of the promise, in verse 17. He's talking about us. He's saying, have assurance. God made this promise to you. He means everyone who has true faith in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, whether slave or free, whether male or female. It doesn't matter if you're Abraham by blood. It only matters if your sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus through faith in him. And if that's you this morning, then God wants you. It actually said God desires for you to be absolutely assured of your faith. Certain of your faith. Why? Because our faith is in a God who has sworn upon himself to do everything he has promised for us and to us. So first, our assurance is based on God and his promises. And since all of God's promises are sure, we can be sure. God wants all of his children to fully believe in all of his promises. Why do I keep saying all of his promises? Why not this this one promise to Abraham? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all of the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. They're all to us. They're all for us. So the only question for you right now is, do you believe all of God's promises? God has promised 
salvation to those who put their faith in Christ. So ground your hope and your faith in God and his promises. Our assurance is based on the promises of God. The God who made a promise and an oath to Abraham, ultimately to Christ, through Christ, to us who are heirs of the promise, if we have faith in Christ. So that's the first reason he gives for us to have full assurance in our faith. Do you believe in the promises of God? All of them. They're for you, church. Second, God wants us to be certain of the unchangeable character of his purpose. So first his promise, now his purpose. Verse 17, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, show us what? What did he want to show us? The unchangeable, unchangeable character of his purpose. I just read in a psalm, God does whatever he pleases. His purposes will stand. They are unchangeable because he's unchangeable. God has promised to us. God has made an oath to us through Christ. And now, God wants, he desires for us to be even more convinced, more assured. Not because of anything in us, but because of the unchangeable character of his purpose. So first, God's promises are true, and now we see God's purposes are unchangeable. Put your faith, this is what he's telling you, Put your faith in the absolute sovereignty of God. And you can be sure. What is this purpose he refers to? Well, the writer of Hebrews has referred to it in multiple ways throughout. Hebrews 2.3, he calls it a great salvation. Hebrews 2.14 through 18, he says his purpose, God's purpose for us is we would be set free from the fear of death because we know like Abraham knows, that it is God who makes the propitiation for our sins. Hebrews 4 says God's purpose for us is that we would know we have eternal rest in him. Later we'll see God's purpose to us in salvation is that we would know we will be with him in the new heavens and new earth. God wants us to be 100% convinced of all of his purposes. To be certain of what God intends for us now and in the future. Base your hope on God's purposes. However, if we don't know God's purposes, we will doubt. Because we will not see what God is doing sometimes right before us. And we will not then trust what he has planned for us now and in the future. I want you to see it again. Verse 17 says, God desires this for us. That we would be more convinced of the unchangeable character of his purposes towards us. Isn't this why the Apostle Paul could say, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For, the, for who? For those who are called according to his purpose. If you've been called by God from darkness to light, from a life of sin and worldliness to a life of righteousness and godliness. If God has saved you through Christ, then all of his purposes are for you. For your good and for his glory. Be convinced of that. It's God's desire for us, church, to be confident of this. All of God's promises are certain. All of God's purposes will happen. Church, our assurance is a big deal to God. He lets us into his heart here. It's his desire for us. According to this verse, God doesn't want to see any of his true children in a state of doubt or worry. And when you are, he wants you to know it's because you're relying upon yourself not trusting in his promises or believing or seeing his purposes. Put your faith in God. He promises by an oath to fulfill all of his promises to us and to accomplish 
all of his purposes for us. So much so that we'll see this throughout the rest of the book of Hebrews. When we talk about faith and boldness and even meeting together, a lot of it is grounded upon this truth. Do you know for sure God has saved you? Because if you do, you should know God will do whatever it takes to keep you. He desires for us, therefore, to put all of our faith in him. To believe all of his promises for us. And for all of his will to be done, because it will be. He will accomplish all of his purposes towards us. As an aside, as a connection to what we had seen previously, if you believe this to be true, this will cause you to move on to maturity. Because you'll want to know God's promises. You'll want to know God's purposes. You'll want to devour the word. Because the more you know them, the more assured you'll be of who he is and what he does. You'll dig into the word. You'll obey all that he has commanded. Radically. The more and more you know his promises and understand his purposes. How can we be sure of these things? Truth number three. Our assurance is grounded, it says, on these two unchangeable things. And God never lies. Verse 18. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. God grounds his promises to us and his purposes towards us on two unchangeable things. God's promise to us and not only his promise to us, remember, he swears an oath upon that promise. And both of those are unchangeable. He's not taking the promise back. If you've been saved by God, then he has promised these promises to you through Christ. He's promised to forgive all of your sins, to cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness, to preserve you, to keep you, to take you to be with him forever. Promised, guaranteed, sealed with an oath. So we ask, can God's plans be thwarted? No. Will God run out of time or run out of power to fulfill any of his plans? No. Does God do whatever he pleases? Yes. And does God ever lie? No. It's impossible for God to lie. So unchangeable thing, number one, God promised it. God said it. God will do it. And if that's not enough for your full assurance, he wants us so confident of his promises and his purposes that he goes a step further and he swears by it. God is faithful. God does what God says he will do. You can trust him in everything. He never lies. God fulfilled his promise to us ultimately in Christ. The promise was kept. The oath was sealed. God in the flesh, Jesus, the promise of God, the very purpose of God, Jesus came, lived, and died for the sin of all those he came to save. Every single sin of every single one Jesus saved. Forgiven. Jesus sealed the deal. He rose again. Resurrected to life. And therefore, we who have repented of our sin and put our faith in Jesus can say, we can believe these promises He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Promise. Or, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Promise. Or Paul to the Philippians. And to us, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Another promise. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Those are good promises. I should see more smiles right now. 
Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Jesus, in John 6, 37. And all the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus in John 10, 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Amen. All of these promises are made by a God who never lies. The one true God who made the promise to Abraham and swore an oath upon it. That promise to us and through Christ all of his promises are to us. And they've been answered and the answer is yes. God has said it. God never lies. He can't. Ground all of your assurance in this God. And then your assurance can be sure and deep and wide and forever because God is. No circumstance in life is bigger than these promises. And they've been sworn by our God to us. God is saying to you, put your hope in nothing else but me and my promises. Live your life by nothing else but my word and my promises, my purposes. When you struggle to believe, when you struggle to obey, when you don't know what to do, remember, God is saying, I made a promise. Took an oath upon that promise. I never lie. So how do we respond to this? First, if you're not sure if you're saved, if you've not been born again, if you have not fully trusted in Jesus for salvation and truly repented of your sin, or if you're drifting, dull of hearing, doubting, in sin, wishy-washy, living one foot in the world and one foot in the church, if any of those describe you, what do you do this morning? Confess. Don't fake it. And repent and believe. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Put your hope and your trust in the God of this promise. However, this text was meant for those who do believe in Christ. For those of you who Jesus is your Lord and Savior. If you've turned from your sin and are living by faith in him for salvation, stop putting any of your trust in yourself. Put all of your trust, 100%, in the promises of God, knowing for sure that God's purposes will be done. And then, with full assurance of faith, the text tells us, be patient. Be patient with God because he always fulfills his promises. Verse 15, and thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. God fulfills all of his promises. And sometimes we believe that and then we want it on our timing. Abraham shows us here, be patient. Paul tells us what this means. In hope, he, Romans 4, 18 through 20, in hope he, Abraham, believed against hope so that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Notice, patience made him stronger in his faith. Trust and obey God fully. No matter what's happening in this silly, messed up world, No matter what comes against God, his church, us, be patient. Trust God in his promises. He will fulfill all of his promises and purposes. Number two, with full assurance, flee to God for refuge in times of need. Verse 18, we who have fled for refuge. 
So who are the we who have fled for refuge? Maybe a reference to a text in Numbers, but I'm just going to say, if you have full assurance of your faith in God, you're going to flee. That's how it defines us here. If you've put your faith and trust fully in God and his promises, that he will complete his purposes, if you have full assurance, you're going to flee. First, flee from sin. Free, flee from living for this world. Flee from fear. Flee to God. Run to God. In God we find true freedom and refuge. There is no safe space in this fallen world. But God is our refuge. Flee to him. He will fulfill all of his promises and accomplish all of his purposes. Number three, find strong encouragement in the promises of God. We who have fled might have strong encouragement. This is part of moving on to maturity. I'm going to give you some homework. Dig deep into the word of God. Find promises. Find some promises. Memorize some promises. Have a list of promises like I do on your phone in a note. Or a sheet of paper in your pocket. Or wear one on your wrist. Read God's promises. Meditate on God's promises. Preach God's promises to yourself. Tell God's promises to one another. If you're not believing or someone you know is not believing or is fleeing or is drifting, remind them God never lies. God never sleeps. God never falters. He always does what he says he will do. He always finishes everything he starts. And maybe most importantly for today, he never loses any of his sheep, ever. Number four. Hold fast to the hope God has set before us. Verse 18. Remember, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The strongest, most certain faith is grounded on God and his promises and knows the God who makes those promises will fulfill those purposes. And his purpose for us is unlimited future grace. So set your hopes not on things of this world. Hope in God. And know what he has planned for us in the future. Study what he has planned for us in the future. Believe it. Trust it. For example, Revelation 21, 1 through 7. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. To the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Hold fast to what God has coming for us. Number five, be certain that God has your soul anchored. I pause because of how awesome that is. Verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor. Anchor of our soul. Our soul. Our soul is anchored. You want to be sure of your salvation? Your soul is anchored to him. If you are in Christ, you can be sure your soul is anchored to him. Number six. Be steadfast because your soul is anchored to Jesus. 
Your hope and your assurance are only as powerful as the one your hope and assurance are in. And only as steady as the one you are anchored to. And so you can be sure and steadfast. Because of Jesus. He's the very anchor of your soul. Finally, be reminded again that the one your hope is in went before us as the great high priest forever. He ends this way. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is a high and lofty hope. When Jesus ascended from this earth, following his resurrection, he entered into the heavenlies, to the very presence of the Father. And I want you to look at these words. Why did he do that? To the church, hear me say, on our behalf. On our behalf. So I ask you, if Jesus right now is pleading with the Father on your behalf, What is it that you have to worry about? And how sure can we be of our salvation if Jesus is doing that for us? One hundred percent completely assured. No doubt. If Jesus is the high priest forever, which he is for us, the church, which sin of yours has not been covered by his blood? If he's our forerunner and our anchor, may we be fixed upon him, church. So we're not drifting away from him, following him and becoming more like him. May we boldly follow Jesus, run to Jesus, grow in maturity, grow in our knowledge of him and our obedience to him, and zealously live for him as a church. May we be a church fully certain of our salvation and where our hope comes from because it is fully grounded in him and not us. And for any who struggle with assurance, I would love to talk to you and help you look to Jesus. Jesus who came as a human being, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, rose again from the dead, and entered into the heavenly places as our great high priest to reign supreme and rule and intercede on our behalf. Put your hope in that. My desire for each and every one of you is the desire of the author of Hebrews that each of you would show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know I know I am limited. I have only scratched the surface of the glory you have shown us. But none of it will enter our hearts and minds unless you make it happen anyway. So that's what I ask, Lord. You would fill us with hearts of joy and love for what you've done for us. anchored our soul. That you would give us full assurance in our faith that we would believe all of your promises are for us and we would desire to know all your purposes because we know they will stand. Give us, Lord, rock-solid foundational faith that is fully, fully, completely assured in you. Amen. Let's sing.